2000 US census <laughs> was the first time that people of mixed race were able to indicate more than one race. <laughs> and that year, more than 6.8 million Americans chose to identify themselves that way. Fast forward to 2008, and I'm in middle school, and still dreaming of one day becoming president. You can imagine how excited I was when I heard about Obama, the possibility of our first mixed race president. By the time of our mock election, Obama had already gone from our first mixed race president to our first black president. My 13-year-old mind was racing. If he's mixed, then he's not black, he's mixed. Who decided he was black? Unfortunately, my questions went un unnoticed and unanswered as I saw the shift in perspective that this new, in my opinion, less accurate label left on my fellow classmates at my predominantly African-American middle school. So, thus far, I've intentionally left you in the dark about my own racial makeup. Have you started to make your own inferences? If so, when do you think that they started? Was it when I first came out on the stage? And if so, did it change when I implied that I was of mixed race when I began talking about the 2008 election? Regardless of your internal answers to those questions, I'm going to list my racial makeup in the order that people are least likely to list when guessing. I am Mexican, white, and African-American. My grandmother is Mexican, and she married a white man, and they eventually gave birth to my mother, who is half white and half Mexican. My biological father is African-American. Growing up, people were always quick to assume that I was some part African-American, which makes sense since my, outwardly, uh, my outward appearance is you know, darker skin, curly hair, more stereotypically African-American features. But I grew up in a primarily white household, so I felt mostly white. <clears throat> I grew up with my mom, and I'm gonna call him my dad, the man who raised me. Oftentimes, I felt white on the inside, but I realized as growing up, living as an adult now in <laughs> America, that though I may feel white on the inside, um, my darker features and more African-American uh, <laughs> features will cause people who are quick to judge a book by its cover to put me in a category that I don't put myself in. You can see now, um, <laughs> I'm 22 now, and it still makes me uncomfortable uh, when I go out to dinner with my family. I will um, think about kind of, are people thinking that I am adopted? Are they thinking that I am just a family friend? And I can see how this picture, minus me at the top, isn't cause for many questions. But when you add me in, it kind of changes the dynamic. I mean, not for us, but for the outside world. And it was the outside world that gave me a little bit of trouble the summer of 2015. It was my first summer of chemistry research at Furman, and I, um, it was also the first summer that um, there was a lot of controversy about the Confederate flag still being flown over the state house. Um, I will be completely honest and let you know that my interest in politics did not start until the summer after my sophomore year. So I had a general understanding of what was going on, but mostly felt like I had no dogs in that fight. So when I pull up to the 7-Eleven outside the back gates of Furman, I took note of the two white males in their white pickup truck with the huge Confederate flag sitting out the back of it, but no more notice than I would to any other loiterers at a gas station. So I get out of my car, I'm pumping my gas, and all of a sudden I hear someone yelling, lynching, and I think to myself, well, that's a word you don't hear every day. Um, and I look around and realize that it's the two white men from the back of their truck and they're looking at me and they're yelling lynching in my direction. I'm $10 worth of gas in, I abruptly stop pumping gas, trying really hard not to, to look too flustered and I drive away. It's the summer after my sophomore year when I find myself at Furman again conducting chemistry research when I decide to go to a um, poetry slam hosted by a local slam poet in the area. I get to the event and I walk into the room and everyone in attendance is African American. I immediately feel my armpits beginning to sweat as I become hyper aware of my whiteness. Um, I saw a smile as I make my way to a table at the front of the room. 
And I sit down and I see that there's a TV in the corner playing a black and white documentary that looked like it was about slavery. So I pretend to be super enthralled in this until the slam poet that I know comes forward and welcomes us to the Juneteenth Poetry Slam. In a strange turn of events, I ended up being one of the judges for the evening. And so here we go. The first slam poet comes up. She's got tears coming down her face. She gives this heart-wrenching poem about slavery and black oppression that I just shrivel up inside. Some of you may know what Juneteenth is, but at the time, I had no idea. Juneteenth is the celebration of June 19th, 1865, when the enslaved people of Texas were finally set free. This is a whole two and a half years after President Lincoln gave his Emancipation Proclamation that set um, um, all slaves free in January of 1863. Um, I was, to say the least, completely overwhelmed. Uh, uh, I had, I was in this room with all of these strong emotions and I just felt like an intruder on this significant day in the lives of these people. I just felt like I just didn't know, um, I was not raised with the same sense of awareness of the past that was inherent to these African American people. So in the first situation, I was being viewed as other by a group that I always thought I had been a part of. And not in the same way that the people in my elementary and middle school always questioned me with their childlike curiosity. This was misplaced anger and hatred that it seemed a few minutes spent getting to know me could not do much to prevent. Um, in the second situation, again, I just, I didn't have the same understanding of the past, and there was no way for my mom and my dad, both of mostly kind of white background, to prepare me for that situation. Um, as a kid growing up, the most common question I often heard was, so are you adopted? And oftentimes I would say, no. And the follow-up question was always something along the lines of, well, what are you then? <laughs> And at the first time I heard this question, it really rattled me because I was in the sixth grade at a um, new private school after spending my entire elementary career in a predominantly African-American middle school. And it didn't help that my mom and dad had just given birth to my brother, who you saw here looks just like them. <laughs> um, but quickly I was able to uh, remember that year as a time when I learned that there were other people in the world and that I was going to be able to figure out what being Alexis was like. Before I kind of move forward, I don't want you to leave this conference thinking that people of mixed race are just black and white or even mostly looking like me. So I'm going to show you some pictures um, of people of mixed race and before um, I kind of show you what their races are, I just want you to watch your mind. Are you starting to try and guess what their race is? And if so, you know, what information are you using um, to kind of make your inferences? So first we have Michael and John. Michael, and, uh, Michael is half African American and half Asian American, specifically Korean, and his half brother John is half African American and half Syrian. Next we have um, Anand. Anand is half white and half South Asian, specifically Indian. And growing up, he felt like he identified most strongly as Indian because he grew up in an Indian community in America and he was able to go to an Indian high school in, uh, or go to high school in India. But he felt that um, his identification as Indian was frustrating for others because he felt that he didn't fit the label of Indian um, phenotypically or linguistically. Next we have Donna and Kim Hunter, two sisters. So Donna and Kim are uh, half white, specifically German, and half black. I think this is really interesting because I know plenty of people who are half black and white and they look a lot more African American than Donna and Kim do. And in their interview, they expressed that um, they were often given the label of white, whether they wanted it or not, and how that was very frustrating for them because they had a hard time connecting to their black heritage and they often felt that they were not oppressed enough. So. 
Now that your definition of mixed race is hopefully sufficiently all jumbled up, um, I would like to uh, bring to your attention some issues that are kind of more recent. So I was recently scrolling through my news feeds when I saw some conflicting headlines um, about Colin Kaepernick. Something like, the awakening of Colin Kaepernick, and my father stood for the same reason that Colin Kaepernick sits. Now, I thought, okay, well, I should look into this a little bit more. And if you don't know, Colin Kaepernick is a football player who recently decided to sit during the national anthem instead of stand as a silent protest against um, a country that he felt like, oppresses people of color. Um, I was going through and I thought, okay, well, this is interesting because one, as someone who doesn't watch football, I did assume that Colin was African American. And so when I started looking into some images, I saw that he was mixed. And I was extremely excited because I thought, okay, great, this is someone of mixed race using their influence to talk and help people of color. Um, but then I did a little bit more research and I found some other people saying that they thought it was disingenuous for a millionaire, especially one raised comfortably by a white family, to speak out on um, black oppression. And so, at first I thought to myself, okay, well, who feels this way? White people, black people, and after some research, I saw that white people um, thought that it was not okay for someone of mixed race to speak out on black oppression, but black people also thought it was not okay for someone of mixed race to speak out on black oppression because he didn't actually know their struggle. And I'm over here as a person of mixed race myself at a complete loss for words. So, basically, here we are in 2018, and we're still all about race. Our president is promoting a ban on immigrants. We may be seeing the, seeing the repeal of DACA, and we have white supremacists feeling a very real need to come forward. We can't know everyone's lived experience, and um, I hope that, or today I've given you some examples that range from personal testimony to American history that hopefully show you just how nuanced race really is. I'm not here to tell you that I think that people of mixed race are the future or the key to the end of racism. I only hope that by incorporating people of mixed race into our conversations that we can maybe move past racial categories to a racial spectrum and eventually off of race altogether. I think that the best way to solve a complex problem is by looking at it from various angles and perspectives. When did um, excluding intel intelligent minds ever win someone a Nobel Prize? Thank you.